good afternoon everyone welcome to the third and the final session of this day so we have dr siddharth ramesh dr siddharth ramesh is a training is a doctor by training self taught programmer by passion founder and ceo of mint block and an inspiration to many he has used blockchain technology for storing health records and showed the world how the latest technologies like blockchain can improve our health industry manifoldly he focuses on healthcare standards and analytics to improve patient lives so in this session dr ramesh shall be enlightening us all on health stand on health data standards and their needs extending a very warm welcome to you sir now i'd like to hand it over to uh, dr ramesh to address the gathering over to you sir yeah hello everyone so thank you for the introduction uh, good evening so i am a doctor by profession and when i was in around second year of medical school uh, we started a project so we wanted to basically make uh, gather data and then find patterns in uh, a certain disease so what happened was uh, we tried to get this data from the hospital we tried and we asked them okay what kind of data do you have and we were surprised to find that they really didn't have any sort of data and this is a hospital that uh, gets about you know 1000 patients per day and they didn't have any sort of uh, data to go about doing our research uh, and there was again the another uh, thing was there was the data the data was available but then getting um, getting any meaningful use out of the data was almost close to impossible so that's when uh, it hit me okay uh, there should be a better way to uh, go about doing this and uh, that's when i came up with uh, the concept of med blocks and back then it was all you know the blockchain was uh, in the hype phase and uh, everyone was going blockchain blockchain uh, and i also just created uh, another software that can upload a records upload healthcare records to the blockchain um and i can you know show you around that but then that uh failed pretty quickly because much most of the hospitals in india and in fact all around the world do not represent uh, healthcare data in using per standards they don't use a particular format so let's just say for example you have a picture and everyone in the world knows that a uh, jpeg is the format for a picture now if you send around this picture uh, you know you can you can uh, make sense of what this picture is you can train machine learning models on this picture all that is fine but if you have no idea what the format of a picture is going to be and you spend most of your time understanding what is in the picture rather than making uh, you know advances in machine learning for example that's that is where healthcare is right now is that people don't know how to represent the same data across multiple departments even in the same hospital they represent it in different ways uh, and that's when uh, i shifted gear and moved more towards standards and more towards uh, trying to make uh, healthcare data easily accessible to applications so if you take a look at um, what question that comes up first is that where is the data so before you can talk about machine learning before you can talk about any sort of analytics we need to understand where this data is and if you think about a hospital like uh, india any hospital in india you take 90% of this data is all is still in pen and paper it's it's in paper it's in paper records and the way you get this uh, data is by looking through paper records and then uh you know manually converting that into some sort of a digital equivalent maybe excel sheets uh, and i see this happening again and again people have paper records and they need to transfer that into a, an excel sheet for their particular research project uh and <clears throat> in in the us and in other countries uh the data primarily resides in electronic health records and if you look at electronic health records in the us for example these are all the you know uh, famous electronic health records in the us and us is actually a really bad example to show you because it's a really bad system so all of these uh, 
EHRs or electronic health records are expensive beyond reason. They are so expensive that uh, a practitioner who is just doing one specialty can't really afford these EHRs. If you are in a government setup or if you are, you know, you have multiple specialty clinics, then fine. But then if you are doing it alone, uh, if, if you are the solo practitioner, you really can't afford any of these EHRs. Uh, let alone, you know, have meaningful data used and things like that. Now, the reason behind why this has happened this way uh, is how uh, hospitals and healthcare systems evolve over time. So I I'll show you, you know, what usually happens. So you have usually one department or one hospital to begin with. And there is one software, which is the health information system that one particular IT team creates for this hospital. Uh, now, it's all well and good, and uh, this is fine for most scenarios for, you know, very simple hospital. Then quickly, this starts becoming a little bit more complicated. You then have a demographic service. You then have a, a lab information system service. And it, it starts, you know, um, the same IT team starts building these multiple systems for a hospital. So now you can imagine why this would be expensive, because... The same team has to uh, manage multiple modules and all of these modules are a whole, you know, they are completely different software in, in, in themselves, right? And then you get to generation two, where each department wants to have a slightly different uh, EMR, right? Like you don't, uh, the ophthalmology department is not going to have the same requirements as the cardiology department. So what they do is they kind of make their own EMR, they have their own database, and then they communicate. Uh, they need to communicate, like this, uh, this is the second generation where they don't really communicate, but the patient goes through multiple departments. So having these specialized EMRs for each department doesn't really work that well. So that's where the messaging comes in. So you start sending around data through uh, APIs and through messages. Uh, and this is the third generation, as I like to call it. So this is again, super expensive because when you think about building the EMR, you only think about what you want at that point in time. And whatever data you have inside the database, you didn't, you didn't really think about converting that to another department's requirements so doing this mapping is super expensive and uh, this is probably the most expensive generation which is just gen 3 and uh, this is kind of where the us market is right now and for them all of these separate emrs are in fact provided by the same company a company as big as epic can in fact provide all the modules needed for a hospital and the sad part about that is that none of these modules are really great right right because they uh, they are all created by the same company like an ophthalmology module may not be the best in class but since it talks well with other systems in their uh, ecosystem they are locked in it's like you know you have a walled garden and then you lock them in because your data can't really um, get out right so that's when uh, the government started coming up with rules and regulations saying you need to uh, talk uh, to other people using these APIs, using these standardized APIs. Now, <clears throat> can we do better? Can we do better than this? Yes. And again, that's where generation four comes in. Here, what you have is that all of these EMRs uh, share a common clinical data repository. So instead of having their own database, they use this common data repository to sh store shared clinical knowledge. Uh, and this reduces the cost a lot because uh, number one, you don't need to do all the mapping. And number two, because you already think of the standards, you think of how to represent your data before you create your EMR. So this uh, whole shift is happening slowly. Most countries in UK uh, and Europe are starting to follow this kind of a trend. US is still uh, way back in this generation. Uh, pretty much in this generation, but mo much more expensive and much more specialized, I would say. Uh, so coming to, you know, generation four, this is kind of what we would like to go for. And coming to that, India is, uh, you know, a free for all right now. There is not any 
uh, electronic health records in the market that can fit the needs of all the, these departments. And uh, after my lecture, I, I want you to be, I want you to understand the market. I want you to understand what is there, what you can do and where the potential is. So let's take a look at Smart on Fire. So Smart uh, is an app gallery that uh, can run on top of uh, the existing EHRs. So by existing EHRs, I mean mostly US specific EHRs that also follow a certain standard called Smart on Fire. So this got me thinking. So all of these apps can be installed on top of the EHR. And again, the EHR already is really expensive. And on top of that, you are installing these applications. Now, why can we not have an EHR that is super simple, super basic and cheap? And then all of these additional features can then be implemented as an app on top of this. So that is actually my push towards standardization. Why I'm interested in standardization is to get to these applications, is to get these apps to be working within uh, the context of an EHR and be talking to themselves. It's not because of government mandates. So that is again another push for standards. But here in this case, we are really looking at what is possible and what we can do rather than standards for the sake of st standards, right? So let's come to the oldest uh, working standard that pretty much permeates most of uh, you know the healthcare record setting. And again, if you think about India, you don't need to worry about anything. Most of the data is still in pen and paper, so you can uh, you can do you can disrupt the market um, a lot more. All of this, these standards are uh, mostly U.S. specific and U.K. and other developed countries. They follow this. So B2, HL7 uh, is health level seven. They are like a standards committee and they uh, come up with these standards. So V2 was one of the most popular standards that they came up with and it's a messaging standard. So what happens is that uh, you have one, um, so you have one uh, system and you have another system and you want these two to talk to each other. So you send messages. So when a patient arrives, you send a patient has arrived message. When there is a new investigation or a new lab report, you send these messages across and the system on the other side needs to understand what these messages mean and they need to uh, like kind of put it into their own system. So that is how HL7V2 came into the picture. Now, after V2, there was something called V3. We will not talk about that because nobody really followed it. It was really complex for most people and we're just going to skip that. Uh, and after that, uh, we got fire. Okay, so we got HL7 fire. And with fire, they came up with multiple paradigms of how you can communicate. So if we go back to this slide, uh, here again, we are talking about the messaging paradigm where you have uh, multiple discrete systems and you communicate using messages. Now, this is kind of like uh, a clinical data repository that you communicate with and you know maybe make restful calls using an API. So Fire came out and said, okay, hey, I know that we are coming from you know HL7 V2 uh, and we know that you're going to be communicating in messages as well. So you can do messages as well in Fire, but the main uh, Fire is, stands for Fast Health Interoperability Resources. So anything that you want to represent in Fire is a resource. A patient will be a resource, a practitioner will be a resource. And you can just think of a resource as a JSON document, okay? Like a JSON document with some structure here and there, okay? So their main paradigm was the RESTful paradigm. So what I mean by RESTful paradigm is that you have a fire server and you have all of these different applications that talk to the fire server and they, uh, you know, they create new patient records, they delete patient records and all of these different observations and conditions can also be persisted onto a fire server. So that was how the restful paradigm of fire um, came into being. And that is mostly the most popular standard that uh, fire wants you to follow. But again, most people are still following messaging, right? They, they have their own system and they just put a wrapper around their thing so that they can understand fire. So, they have uh, all of these different paradigms you can read up on more. Uh, now, FIRE in itself is not really uh, a standard because they just come out with a base level implementation of what 
um, a resource should look like. Now, on top of that, you need to add uh, other constraints. So this is called profiling. So in, uh, you take a fire resource and then you cut and slice certain uh, requirements and conditions. So for example, this is the uh, vital signs observation profile given by the National Digital Health Mission. So that's done by the Indian NRCES. So this uh, thing, they'll tell you what codes to use, what code systems to use. And here in this, the code system is LOINC. And they also tell you how to represent the value, uh, whether as a value quantity or whether as a value string. So all of these are specifics of how you can profile um, FIRE further. And all of this is required because FIRE by itself doesn't really care what you use. You need to come out with, uh, as a group, as a network or as a country, you need to come out with all of these profiles and resources that you will use within your context of uh, of interoperability. That's that's basically what Fire is. Now, Fire is great in some ways, but then when you really start thinking about complicated clinical data, it really doesn't cut. Um, it really doesn't like suit the needs of most applications. So I'll tell you why. So if you take uh, a look at most applications, how they are built today. So you have some sort of a ORM and you have a database, right? So you manage all of these schemas, you manage all of uh, the table. You can use a NoSQL database, that's fine, but the complexity is still there because healthcare data by itself is really complicated. And uh, you will end up with a schema looking like this if you just work with any healthcare setting for six months that's because they keep changing they then you need to you need to version these schemas and it's really complex so what open air is saying open air or open ehr is again another set of standards for building ehrs so what it's saying is that hey do not worry about that we will come up with a set of things called archetypes so you you have uh, things like you know blood pressure chief complaint, medication, these these things, which is represented in uh, fire as resources. We represent them as archetypes. And you take these archetypes and put them together into what is called a template. So uh, the main difference here is that there is two levels of modeling involved in open air. While in fire, we only have one level of modeling and you need to reinvent the wheel every time you have to change uh, a, a resource. Here in open air, they say, okay, there is this blood pressure archetype. So this is what the blood pressure archetype looks like. Uh, you can see that it has a lot of um, data points and this is done internationally uh, once. So everybody comes together and then they have these review meetings and they um, it's constantly evolving. You can also, if you have a certain point that is not in this, you can then ask them, okay, can I, can I do this? So... The, this archetype is international, it's made once, and then based on your use case, you take this archetype and you put it inside uh, something called a template. And that template is what gets reflected onto the EMR, the final EMR. Uh, now, there are multiple archetypes like pulse, heartbeat, uh, and medication order. And again, if you're doing NLP, right if you're doing a natural language processing this is a is a boon for you like just look at this uh, i had a natural language processing company come to me once and they had uh, they had free text they had a lot of free text saying blood pressure of 120 by 80 measured in the standing position and they didn't know all the different things that blood pressure can have but if you take a look at the archetype in fact all of these things are there like location of measurement is in fact one of the um, key data points and if you look inside location of measurement it will tell you that it can only be standing sitting lying down reclining things like that so uh, yeah any sort of natural language processing that you're doing machine learning use look at look at these archetypes so you can look at this under ckm which is clinical knowledge manager dot open air dot org so just look at all of these. So, you know, we had pulse, heartbeat, uh, medication order, what all can be there in a particular medication order. Uh, so these are all Lego bricks. Okay, like all these archetypes are Lego bricks. Think of them as such. But you can take them and put them together however you want. You can take them and build a nice house. You can build a nice watermelon. Uh, and these house and watermelon and dogs, they are the final situation where you're using this data. 
okay so for example this is a case record like a non traumatic case record and we have like multiple sections so there is a you know problem diagnosis archetype which is like the chief complaint that the patient comes with then we have you know airway breathing circulation and inside assessment you can have like pulse so it's highly hierarchical because we have this two level modeling you have archetypes but you also have this higher level concept called templates now once you post this template this is a template this is called a template so once you post this template then you post uh, these resources called compositions to the open air database then you have something called archetype query language which is like sql but then it works really well on uh, this multi um, like this two level modeling concept so what you can do is you can ask uh, the database hey show me all the blood pressure readings of this patient regardless of the template in which it was captured you can also ask it questions particular to one particular template like ask it to bring out all of you know for example uh, daily monitoring template for example uh, give give me all the data from daily monitoring template uh, and the database will just bring that data back to you now this sort of powerful querying is not there in fire so if you take a look at fire as a clinical data repository on top of which we can build apps on it's kind of limited as to what you can do with it because uh, the primary mode of making queries on a fire server is search uh, and search it can it solves most of the issues but then it doesn't solve really complex querying needs uh, but open air solves that really well using aql and this multi level modeling approach and again that's the main difference between uh, open air and fire fire just says hey all of your data should be one json document and you all together decide what this json document should look like um and that is the whole profiling part open air says your document can actually consist of these building blocks called archetypes and we can like put these together and model them however we, we want so this two levels of modeling allows for a lot more flexibility uh, than this one level modeling approach uh, and again a lot of people usually use open air inside their clinical system and then map it out to fire when uh, they are sending it across to another person so that's completely valid uh, because fire is easier to understand it's easier because it's flat and you can just look at it and say hey that json document that i understand this because it looks like blood pressure that's fine so yeah fire is simple easy to understand but clinical data is not as simple it's in fact to you know you need to model it at this uh at two levels and open air solves that better uh now again when you are looking at uh, how to represent all of this data you also need to think about code systems and snowmed city is an excellent code system so it is um so it maps out exactly what a concept is so for example something like headache right so headache can have multiple synonyms so somebody might call it head pain some might call it uh cephalodynia well like you know doctors call it all different things but uh snowmed city is a sort of a network of concepts so you have multiple concepts and one concept can have multiple parents and one concept can also have multiple children and it can also have relationships to other concepts like for example headache uh, is a child of both head finding and pain finding at anatomical site and it has all these children like acute headache oral headache benign headache blah 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 and it also has this relationship saying finding site to head structure so what we can do with this is that let's say you want somebody to you know just select um a, what complaint they have so if they select headache you can actually show them in a nice diagram that hey it's in the head and like your user will be pleasantly surprised because they'll they'll feel more reassured that you know headache is in the head <laughs> yeah it's so this is not the only code system you'll come across a lot of code systems in uh, healthcare the main ones being rx norm loing icd10 but anything clinical uh, anything that the doctor is recording you will most probably always use snomed ct uh, in fact the drug list for india is also in snomed ct you'll probably use loing when you are uh, when you already know what this test means so all of the other code systems usually happens in the background even icd10 i wouldn't say that a doctor would want to really record the icd10 code they can just record it in snomed city and then map it to icd10 automatically 
because Nomad City is more granular and it it has uh, a lot more concepts than any other thing. The disadvantage is that Nomad City has a, a certain licensing fee, but in India it's free. In India it's free, but in other countries they need to pay a fee. So learn about Nomad City. Do uh, what you want with it. It's uh, it's free in India at least, so you can take that. Now uh, I will stop for a short question answer session and then we'll move on to examples and i also want to know what kind of projects you are working on right since you are all into healthcare healthcare informatics i want to know what kind of projects you are working on uh, before i move into the next phase which is showing you how we can put all of these standards together and make something meaningful and useful so i'll just wait for some questions and i want to know from you uh, if you have worked in some project, if one and what kind of a project that you are working on, so I can maybe suit this more to your needs. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a medical system which a patients with COVID symptoms or is basically all the observations encountered everything and suppose that you already have a, a system made out of simple uh, like vanilla javascript and everything and then we want to uh, implement open ehr standard on that system yeah so how do you go about it yeah okay um so yeah i will give you an example in 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 the coming um, application i'll give you an example on how so i understand that you have a single page application running javascript and you want to like communicate with an open air system correct yeah yeah so mm -hmm. i'll yeah i'll show you an example on how that is done so the step is steps to do that are basically you need to first uh, make the template okay so you need to uh, there is a form a designer called uh, you know there you can use anything any type of designer but there is one designer called archetype uh, designer uh, and that's the most famous one that people use so this is an online software you just take that and you make the template first so you have to um, first think of all the different uh, things that you want to measure okay so you take all of the things that you want to measure in fact i can show you an example right now Okay, so you need to first understand what archetypes uh, you want. Okay, so I'll show you an example. Uh, then once you have the template ready, then what you do is you post this to a clinical data repository. So there is an open source implementation of OpenAir called EHR Base. That's basically what I do for most of my projects. So once you do, uh, once you post it to EHR Base, then you can create these things called compositions. Uh, on the front end so those compositions can then be persisted onto the uh, cdr i'll show you a more detailed example but uh, let me share my screen so this is the archetype designer so this is the url tools.openair.org it's free uh, and uh, i have some videos telling how to use this as well so let's see uh, i have a lot of templates here okay so this particular uh, template we made for the covid care app so uh, there was, we had to monitor patients uh, and, you know, see, these are all the different data points that we are measuring for uh, COVID. So we are measuring their body temperature, blood pressure, pulse. This is the n national early warning score, uh, pulse oximetry, respiration. And even under this, you have a lot of things like pulse oximetry. You may think that it's just SpO2, right? But it also has things like SpOC, SpCO. SP met and you just <coughs> excuse me you just like cancel out these things um, again I, I, I have another tutorial telling how to use the archetype designer so once you have this you just click on export and you get this opt file once you have the opt file you're set you can uh, put it in the CDR which is the clinical data repository and then make uh, make for you know make uh, commits using the front end, using your single page application. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but uh, this is like for the front end, like for the form kind of thing, right? 
So, but how do we process the data on the back end? Suppose if yeah. we have, like, you want to process it on our uh, own database. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this isn't for the front end. This is actually for the back end. This is what we are making here is actually the schema. This, uh, this thing that I'm showing right now, right, is actually the schema. Uh, in fact, I'll come to it in the next example. I think you'll understand a lot better when I show you an example of uh, this application, right? Uh, it, it's probably like the first example case study that I have. So I'll explain this. And if you have any questions after that, maybe you can ask me. Okay, so okay. I'll come Thank to this. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? So there's one question. Sir, yeah. you being a professional doctor, how you got an interest to move into medical informatics domain and uh, to utilize all the IT expertise? Being uh, like you are an MBBS doctor and. What implicated or how you generated your interest in doing all these kind of generation of GUIs so that in actually a doctor who is the end user ultimately of that form will be generating it? Uh, wait, the, so the question is the end user would be, I, I didn't get the last part. So, sir, how come the end user is himself generating the form? How, how this particular interest was generated in you? what inculcated you to do this oh right 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 yeah yeah so i wouldn't think of myself as the end user right i am mostly uh, i would say i'm a lot more interested in coding and uh, technology than in medicine although i am interested in medicine and i you know did it uh, but i'm a lot more interested in how technology can change the whole field uh, so I mean, if you just take a look at how much a doctor has to study, right, to just pass MBBS, right, there is the, you, if you stack your books, it will come up to this, this height. So then um, what you are, most of what we study in uh, MBBS is, you know, knowledge that can very well be outsourced. <laughs> I would say you can you you know certain patterns you learn that okay if this patient comes with this 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 disease uh, it's you know this but then all of these are mostly you know you can i think if algorithms get really good someone with basic knowledge like a nurse or maybe somebody who can just talk to the patient and understand what their symptoms are uh, i believe that they can do a decent job and this is important because we don't have enough doctors today. There aren't enough doctors in India even. And most of them are moving abroad. They are going out and uh, I feel like the only way that you can actually deliver cheap, good quality healthcare in a country like India where we just don't have enough doctors is to get these paramedical people to kind of fill in the gap. And that's where I feel technology and especially machine learning and pattern recognition things like this will make a huge difference uh, because uh, there is a lot of scope if you think about it and yeah that's mostly it and you know it keeps growing the num amount you have to learn in order to stay relevant is it's exponential like the number of papers that is published every year keeps going up and just for you to remain relevant in your field you still need to keep updating yourself and at one point this is not going to work it's not going to be scalable and uh, it's kind of what is happening right now like you you have you don't have mbbs doctors treating anymore you only have specialty doctors in a few years it will become super specialty doctors because you can't keep up with this information overload and that's where like tools uh, and technology can change how we think about you know these courses on these degrees. Okay, thanks Dr. Ramesh. So the point is that if we generate some standard based applications as a sample example is in blocks, so it means that we have to reduce the manpower and uh, the whole society will be benefited by creation of such an application. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, once you have data in, in standard formats, then it's up to the next generation to take it and do what they want with it. So that's, you know, basically what so I then want. It is, yeah. Then it is very easy for maths 
scooter operate with a what is and what what is scooter operate with another right exactly so exactly yeah correct yeah ha- hello hi yeah you just mentioned about open ehr where you uh, said that uh, you had utilized nlp there yeah 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 so can you please explain a little bit how nlp was used there and how can we uh, utilize nlp in healthcare like some examples where we can have nlp yeah yeah uh, i i'm not an expert asterisk so i i don't have too much experience with nlp uh, but there is this thing called uh, identifying what kind of an object something is right what is that called it's called uh, object entity recognition or something like that uh, named entity recognition yeah 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 named entity recognition so correct so that is a very important part of uh, what you have to do when you are dealing with uh, healthcare data okay so let's just say an example right like uh, let me open my notepad so let's just say blood pressure 120 80 um sitting uh upper arm okay so now this uh, can you see this this is too small i'll just make this a little larger okay let's just say that this is the text that you want to um understand in an nlp point of view what what does this mean now i know just by looking at it okay this is blood pressure this is 120 systolic this is 80 diastolic uh, they are they did it in the sitting position in the upper arm okay now it may not be so easy to un- make a computer understand this so that's where this comes in so if you search in open air clinical knowledge manager for blood pressure so they have uh, an archetype called br- blood pressure v2 so if you take a look under this okay um so again like this is mapped completely to snomet ct and all the other standards as well but let's take a look at the mind map so here right so yeah blood pressure that's fine so this 120 we need to kind of find where this quantity goes so that is where uh, so see there is systolic so q means quantity okay so systolic there is systolic and it's a quantity so and it also knows that it can only be from 0 to 1000 mm of hg now you also get the units as what what this is and diastolic there is like 0 to 1000 again like it's mm of mercury okay now what about what about sitting what is this so now if you take a look at the blood pressure archetype and see uh let's see um the position okay in the position you have standing standing at the time of blood pressure according sitting sitting in, for example in a bed or chair so now you know okay sitting is in fact position in which it was measured and upper arm you don't know what this is so let's see location of measurement uh see you have right arm left arm right thigh left thigh there is not upper arm but then if a model is good enough it should probably be able to um like approximate upper arm to either right arm or left arm right so this is what i was talking about so since you have some unstructured data here and you have the exact structure what you want here as a archetype i saw a lot of potential for using using this archetype as the fuel to drive the nlp process where you can kind of utilize this and tag it exactly what is what it may not be fully you know it may not be like seek seek to seek models or like advanced bert level stuff but statistically at least you can do a decent job at finding out what what is what yes sir and so one more thing uh, that you mentioned that you are from medical background so i just wanted to ask that how much knowledge about a particular disease or about particular uh, organs we need to do we need to have once we are using this in healthcare like we are utilizing deep learning or machine learning yeah. so how much medical background we need to have so you don't need to have that much medical knowledge you so for example right let's say nlp you are using you are doing this that is kind of where we want the tools to assist people like you so what we'll technically be doing is that we'll use something like archetypes or the archetype designer will make all of these things and then we'll hand it over to the engineering team that's basically what we do internally also like there are a group of doctors who understand exactly what is the data being captured uh, and they use tools like this to capture what is needed 
and then they hand it over to the technical team now once the technical team gets it all they see is okay quantity it's systolic bp is just a quantity and like position is just like you know uh, a coded text which can either be sitting standing reclining or whatever so for them they don't need to understand the nuances of what it is because uh, there is tooling that can assist in this job okay sir thank you so much hello yes sir integration of genomic sequencing with ehr yeah and which type of data sets we have to take in our machine lab yeah 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 genome sequencing uh, are you working with bcfs uh, yes, sir. Uh, are you working with bcf uh, sir i am trying but uh, in now okay okay That's so good. yeah in genomic sequencing you have uh, you have multiple types okay like there is the i'm pretty sure most people don't do full genome sequencing they have uh, mutant types they tell you what kind of mutation there is Uh, and they represent that in a particular place there is actually a really good project that maybe uh, you can take a look at uh, let me see if i can find the url so uh, that project basically extracts all of this data as structured fire resources it takes a pdf document for example and then extracts all of this data as fire resources and then it utilizes that for uh, machine learning so let me see that project was called I'm not getting the name of it right now. You just send me a mail. I'll get back to you on the name of this project. You you'll find a lot of resources there for gene sequencing. If you can tell me in more specific detail what you're trying to do with the model, right? Actually, sir, uh, my work is on integration of uh, genomic data with EHR to add the realization of personalized medicine. Okay. Ah, uh, using IoT. Okay. 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 So and okay. I am very much confused. How can I set a data set of EHR with genomic sequencing? There is a lot of difference between parameters. Correct, correct, correct. There is a lot of difference. Um, now you can see. Let's see uh, if there are any genomic sequencing archetypes. Okay. So if you take a look at this, right? Uh, so this is an archetype. so in the project genomics there is like genomic inversion variant so just like you have um, normal observations there are specific observations for uh, genome sequencing so if you see genomic okay so genomic uh, variant result genomic substitution variant genomic uh, repeat sequence inversion variant are you seeing all this so these are all yes, the sir. yeah so we have quite a lot of genomic data and you first need to understand what is your use case so your use case is that getting this genomic data in the ehr somehow so that at the point of care you can do uh, some sort of sir for a chronic disease like cancer yeah uh, we want to predict uh, using ehr uh, with genomic sequencing right right and how right. can we predict the same yeah yeah for okay. any chronic disease right right so in covid also we are using genome sequencing for testing mm 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 okay okay so i would say first understand the format of the genome that you are getting what that is what you can do with it uh then like if it's something like cancer right there is a um it would be better if you are searching research papers with that particular allele or with that particular mutant and seeing what is the best treatment available for uh, that particular gene so ibm watson does something like that so it it takes a look at the genome that this patient has and then it looks through this whole library of uh, you know all of these different um, research papers and then from that it picks out okay what is the best treatment available for this patient at this point in time so it does a lot of nat- natural language processing to understand all those research papers uh and that is one thing that you can look at the other thing is understanding um how you can uh, use this data immediately right like so then you need to also collect other data like for example if somebody is been given a drug if some patient has been given a drug and you know the genomic sequence of this patient you need to also measure how this drug behaved what what is this drug what this drug did to the patient so 
if you record all that you can come out with your own research papers and you can come out with um your own uh, you know kind of inferences so that's kind of how i would think of integrating the ehr with the genomic data not not like you know directly bringing the genome and telling the physician hey this person has this genome uh, so maybe you can come out with some alerts saying what what is what but like understand the data structure first understand the data structure of the genome and then try to do some thing on it so my objective is as you seen present this scenario is all healthcare professional are using ehr only for prescription of any treatment to the patients uh, my objective is that the prescription is fully based on genomic sequences as well as ehr no so you are think see yeah the they are using the ehr to treat the patient correct now you have genomic data data so what do you want to do with that right now the if a person has a family history on the based on genomic data then already a health professional can aware all oh, right whatever right right. right right in future they will never face such problem a uh, rest of patient already face my okay. issue is that okay 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 got it uh yeah so this is a very specific application you will have to look at uh, there are only so many common genome uh, markers available for these kind of things right so i would say um, look at those common uh, genomic markers and if they are present maybe create an alert in the ehr so again you have to integrate with the ehr somehow so if you get this data you can maybe show the clinician okay this this patient has this particular common genomic thing be aware and again what needs to be done based on that is probably um you need to look at research papers to actually understand what the best course of treatment should be so it's 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 a good initiative i feel like it's a good initiative but then see how you can get the d- data and do something very simple first like just look at common uh mutants and then show it to the you know physician at the time of a uh, treatment so they can at least look at research papers themselves uh, they don't need to you don't need to do any automatic sort of um uh, clinical decision support okay thank you sir thank you please provide us uh, your uh, email sir please yeah yeah i'll provide it in the end in the end of the presentation i have a slide with my email uh, so just you know wait thank for you. that thank yeah. you sir yeah yeah hello yeah yeah uh, uh, dr siddharth i have uh, one question before that i want to tell you that i have heard about you in 2018 when i read a news that uh, a guy from manipal right has uh, integrate blockchain uh, with the medical data right right, right. so you know i uh, uh, since then i am following you you know i am also your subscriber also right. on that youtube channel actually i just want to know that uh, now you are uh, posting videos on F, uh, hl7 and fhir so you know uh, like uh, for blockchain uh, do you think really uh, uh, blockchain is also uh, you know helpful for making these uh, interoperable things for the medical data Do you, do you really think or you know uh, earlier uh, uh, when i was following you you said that it makes uh, data more patient centric and granular access uh, it provide to the users so right. it, what is your view that uh, yeah. blockchain can be used for interoperability purpose or uh, not yeah uh so again thank you i'm humbled that you've been following me since 2018 uh but yeah uh, coming to the question so blockchain is a messaging level problem okay uh, actually it's a messaging level solution i would say blockchain is on another level on top of you know all these other uh, messy things that's going on in the real world okay if you take a look at the ehr if you take a look at the data that we have today uh we first need to convert this into some standard format that everyone can understand before we move on to the blockchain so once we solve this blockchain would just be the next natural step okay because we can have you you already have data in the standardized format you already know what what you mean by this right now we don't have that itself like we don't understand what this data is 
let alone like uh, yeah you can put data that doesn't mean much on the blockchain but the value that it delivers to everyone would be limited so that's the main differentiating thing like right now we have uh we have servers we have single servers we have you know uh, api calls being made that can kind of simulate what a blockchain would do and in fact uh, india coming up with the national digital health mission that's what they are doing any hospital can communicate with any other hospital using these network calls and they can just get the data now after getting the data what useful information that has is again depends on uh, what structured data they are getting back correct so that's where fire and open air and all these standards snowmed city all of them if this data is loaded with that kind of information then yes it will be useful it will be you can do some sort of meaningful analysis with this data but if it's just a pdf document uh, of a report again fire you can also attach a pdf document to fire and that is completely allowed by the national digital health mission as it stands right now so if you're getting a pdf document what are you going to do with that like if you're i i get that you can do something with it rather than having no data but then structured data is where the real power of analyst analytics and uh, you know the, these value driven applications are and blockchain would provide more value to those that kind of data not pdf documents that's what i feel thank thank you thank you thank you okay if we have no more questions we'll move on to the next segment which is real world applications and uh, example apps that uh, we've built with using all these standards <clears throat> i'll just wait for another uh, Two minutes before any questions. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. The, just now you told that uh, uh, we can uh, do something like that, sharing the data between the hospitals. Yeah. So I was working uh, on some similar project, and one idea I had is like when one hospital is sharing some data of some patient to another hospital, uh, isn't uh, there should be something like uh, we should have a confirmation from the patient like this. data of yours is being shared with this particular hospital before sharing correct correct yes there should be and there is also one mechanism it's called the consent manager so it in in the program right now the national digital health mission there is something called a consent manager application that the patient uh, needs to have with them so once a hospital requests information for that patient the patient will then you know how to confirm and then it gets this data from that hospital uh, but a better approach would actually be that the patient actually owning the data so if if the hospital does not have the data and it's the patient who is you know there are multiple hospitals and each hospitals like just send the data to the patient's own application or the patient's own private database then naturally the only way to get this data would be to ask the patient so and not ask another hospital then ask the consent of the patient and do this this thing so uh yeah that's that's it's called a phr like a private personal health record phr so phrs are also upcoming and a lot of people are working on personal health records uh, so all of these hospitals will then send the data directly to the patient first and the patient will then send it to the next person so here the whole control of the data is is with the patient and you also get extra benefits like using that data the patient can then run applications himself or herself using that data and like can derive value out of that data so that's where your analytics tools and all can also come in so yeah that's phr personal health records thank you Yeah, somebody is raising the hand. Just uh, Jay Shri Raju. Yes, Jay Shri Raju. You can ask, and you can ask. This is one of the session where the questions are being taken up, taken up in the middle of the session. Hello. Yeah. I'm sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Actually, I am uh, carrying out my research for uh, work in under the performance metrics evaluation for early detection of chronic kidney disease. Okay. The problem is uh, I am going to get the clinical parameter from the uh, UCI repository. Okay. But the thing is, before getting the clinical parameter, the person, the individual the patient has to be diagnosed at early stage by identifying his so initial symptoms. Okay. Now, I have a doubt in that. Uh, I need a suggestion that how can we get the initial symptoms from the hospitals or uh, can we get this unstructured uh, symptoms where doctor would have written the health uh, care records of these patients? I want suggestion about it. Right, right, right. Yeah, again, like it depends on which hospital you're working with. So if you, uh, okay, I don't want to ask the name of the hospital, but I'm sure that 90 people... Yeah. Still working with any of the hospitals, sir. I'm just trying to start about it. How can I approach okay, okay, and okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, in India, very, very few hospitals actually have an EHR where they write these symptoms. Okay, and yeah, even when they write the symptoms, they use free text. So, uh, what I would say is, if you are working with this kind of a hospital, uh, which has mm -hmm. some sort of an Apollo for one, has uh, and uh, Fortis has an EHR where they record these things. Uh, then uh, Columbia again has an EHR where they record the sim symptoms. So again, these are all like chain hospitals that uh, are present, but they don't deliver most of the healthcare needs of uh, the country. It's mostly these middle to you know small hospitals that are delivering uh, you know the edge care. So. If you can tie up with these hospitals and if you can get access to their uh, unstructured record and again i'm not sure anyone is really using uh, snowmed right now ideally you would be using uh, something like snowmed to capture these signs and symptoms so if you do that then you, you don't have to bother with analyzing the free text you, you know exactly what that symptom is and using snowmed you can easily uh, triage a patient based on signs and symptoms but uh, i would say first get the unstructured text if you can from these hospitals emr you will need to talk to the it team go through the whole process it will be a long process to get the unstructured data but once you get it uh, then you take a look at how you can map this into something more meaningful so there you can use something like snowmed city so again the whole natural language processing is also being done on snowmed city so you can you can like for example a doctor will probably write something like patient came with complaints of uh you know urinary retention since four days now all you need to care about is urinary retention four days so that process needs to be done first so all before that you need to do some cleaning work so the data that you get may not be clean and you, you'll need to uh there might be a lot of unnecessary information there so do some cleaning then try to get what is the condition what is the duration uh then after that uh see that and, and it's not as easy because there are some nuanced things that the, they may write in the record like a uh, patient does not have history of uh bleeding for example so it's not bleeding it's does not have history of bleeding so you, you it's kind of a sophisticated uh approach to convert this free text into something meaningful so but again like all the best there there are papers out there converting this to snowmet ct uh, you can take a look at that and that will be a good start okay sir okay thank you sir so can you have any can i get your mail id sir so that yeah, yeah, i have yeah, any further in, the, in the end of the session i'll put it okay fine in fact i'll put it right now because some people may leave in the middle uh okay wait i'm just going to put the last slide right now so don't worry they'll not leave we'll take their attendance later also oh okay <laughs> Oh, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> okay, Thanks, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, should we shall shall we move to some examples? Yes, sure, sure. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so now I've talked about uh, you know what these standards are, how we can use them. I'll show you some demo applications. Okay. Uh, and yeah, coming to that COVID example, uh, the question that I got, I will be addressing that uh, right now. So Medblocks right now is actually a set of tools that you can use to build a standardized application. 
okay it's a stack for building modern healthcare records and it's all free and open source most of it is free and open source uh, now what my dream is is to have a sort of a health app ecosystem where you can create your own apps you can publish them and you can use other people's apps to get started with your own ehr the way today the way how it is is that you need to start from scratch and you need to build a billing system you need to build build the you know a pharmacy system you need to build the medication system and before you get to the point which delivers value before you get to the app which delivers value uh, you are already deep in what do you say technical debt you are already building things that you don't want and with this approach where you just build the app that you want you only add value by building that app and then all the other things are already in place the uh, the demographics app is already in place the medication app is already in place so that is the system that i want to build and i'm telling you how i built that so again the world is not binary so it's not fire or open air it's fire and open air so we are using both and we have a postgres server that uh, is there in the background and oauth2 is the authentication mechanism that we are using okay and all of the things that happen on both fire open air and postgres all of these are transmitted as events that are available to these applications so i'll, I'll show you an, an example so now an app uh, in the medblock stack should number one have uniform clinical information models okay and again i think this is probably the first time i'm demonstrating this to the public so this is again like also medblock stack announcement video i guess so an example application should have clinical information models that should be uniform now how you decide this is using either open air archetypes and templates or fire profiles so these are the two options you have you need to use open air or fire you can also use both but you need to tell everybody what uh, what is the structure of your data you're doing that using fire and open air and uniform authentication mechanism you are using oauth2 which is the industry standard and you are also distributing this application in a standard format which is a docker container okay now what is an application here it's nothing but a docker container along with some metadata okay so in the metadata is where you mention what uh, what clinical models you use you you your which archetypes which templates you are using which fire profiles you are using and then you mention the triggers what should this docker container respond to so it can be as simple as http or https so this can just be a single page application container that is responding to http on a certain port or it can respond to something more complex like a cron job uh, which which runs every day at 12 o'clock or it can be an event that is triggered within the system so for example as soon as uh, a fire resource is committed trigger this event so that it can also be there and then an app can have dependencies so it can either depend on the base services that we just mentioned or it can depend on other apps as well okay so an app is nothing but a docker container that that's you know you should be very clear with that again for people who don't know docker docker is a way to package your application in a uniform way uh, and it basically builds up from the os level it, it builds up from the operating system level so you will have a linux kernel you will have everything and it it will make sure that your app runs exactly the same way wherever you deploy it so be it your own local machine or uh, a cluster on google cloud or azure cloud or aws so uh, the advantage of it being a docker container is that you can scale horizontally so your application when it receives a lot more load you can just spin up a lot more of these containers and it can take the load so that's mainly why we are going with the docker container so this is an example application now we'll do some case studies okay so the first case study is covid and christian mission doctors so uh, this came up as a you know a group of christian doctors wanted to ease the load on hospital beds okay because second wave was really bad and they wanted to um, kind of take medium to low risk patients out of the hospital system and put them in beds uh, themselves like makeshift beds and then monitor them every day and if in case uh, they have certain problems right if in case there are any issues with them uh, with certain parameters 
then they shift them to hospitals so they were doing that using some signs some early warning signs so we'll take a look at what is this uh, so how we built this is that first we made the template okay so this is the process of how we make uh, an application using open air okay so first we make the template so this is the mcs.dailymonitoring v0 and v1 template we make using the archetype designer okay now after that um, i'm going to show you a live demo okay so after we make the template we create what is called as a low fidelity form so we have some tooling called medblocks ui that automatically generates uh, your front end form based on the template so this is how it looks like so this uh, form is automatically generated and you can see okay what all we measured uh, and this is the final output composition that comes out of this form okay you can see that there is a lot of information not too much but there is quite a bit of structured information here okay so this uh, we do first and then we test out which all compositions are working and which all don't so for example, uh, I'll show you the live application also now. So this particular composition didn't work. And the reason is because we were doing something really stupid. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, I'll show you after we come up with this automatic generated form, uh, we then move to the high fidelity form. <clears throat> so hopefully I'm already logged in. Okay, so this is the live application running in a sandbox. Uh, so these are not real patients right now. So all of this, right, all of this is actually coming straight from a fire server. So uh, this is the application. And if you take a look at, you know, Siddharth Ramesh, all of this data is coming from open air. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have graphs and nice uh, little things. So if you go into daily monitoring, uh, this is the form. This is a high fidelity form now. So now what we want is that high fidelity forms are... Uh, a lot more interactive than the low fidelity forms. The low fidelity forms are just, you know, they generate every single data point there is. High fidelity forms are more um, interactive. So for example, if I do, uh, if I fill out all of these parameters, right, it'll show you the early warning score is like six out of 20 and it'll tell you how it's happening. And this is again built all using JavaScript and some front end framework. Okay, so and if we uncheck on air, it shows you the percentage O2 on the flow rate. So the, now the reason why some of the compositions here didn't work was because we were um, we were we were uh, checking on air, but then not inputting the SpO2. So it doesn't make sense to tell that the patient is on air and then not give them an SpO2 reading because this on air is in fact inside the SpO2 archetype. So all of this is like very specific to the open air archetype so we also had a, a lot of other you know things like management the labs all of this will come out uh, as as this table that you see here so this filtering you know all of this filtering we are doing on the fire server directly this is the covid um, status again we're getting this from the open air while we get the patient name and uh, age and all of this we get from the fire server <clears throat> So how we built this, the whole thing is built using a tool called Medblocks UI. So you can check that out. Uh, but again, coming to the bigger picture, uh, it had certain open air templates. It also used fire resources uh, since I uh, just like I told. So it used the patient resource, the practitioner resource, the encounter resource, invoice for, uh, you know, getting donation amounts on how much the patient paid, things like that. <clears throat> and... Uh, it, this responded only to HTTP and HTTPS. So this particular COVID application is a single page application that responds only to HTTP calls. And it's dependent on Open Air Fire and these other two extra app, apps. I'll talk about these apps. So this AQL to Google Sheets, they wanted to export this data from uh, the Open Air data repository out into uh, some sort of a CSV format. Uh, so we used Google Sheets because it's con it was convenient for everyone there to look at the data and just do some analysis ad hoc. So this AQL to Google Sheets app triggers every night at 12 and uh, it just executes a particular AQL. Again, if you forgot about AQL, AQL is like SQL, but for open air, right? It's look, it looks very much like SQL. So it, it executes that and then converts that to a sheet. So this is the sheet that you see here. Uh, <clears throat> 
we also converted all of the open air um, data into fire just just because like what if somebody wants to do analysis on fire so we use something called the microsoft fire converter and we put that and this response to uh, triggers so whenever an open air composition is created it converts it to fire and also whenever a patient is created in fire again we used um, fire for storing the patient records so whenever a patient record is created in fire it will automatically create an ehr in open air again this is all in ehr base uh, so dependency that's fine so all of this sits together okay all of this sits together the covid application is the front end and it's a single page application that talks directly to the fire and open air uh, services and we have these two um, additional apps that are sitting here they are not you can't really expose them to the outside world because they only listen to events within inside so if you had said http then you can make http calls to it also so that is code application let's see um <clears throat> yeah we deployed this on digital ocean and the postgres ql uh, was done by postgres managed service 15 dollars per month or something uh, fire and open air was uh, again a digital ocean droplet running docker compose so you can you can deploy it in multiple ways you can have it as big as you want or as small as you want but we did it around like 2000 per month around that range so that was the whole cost of the application it's still running it's still being used uh, let's come to the second scenario so this is uh, an emergency medicine department in a tertiary care hospital just a prototype to see how you would go about doing it uh, so this is the uh, prototype on how you would have chief complaints so here see since we are using snowmed ct for uh, the code system you once they select headache you know that it's in the head and uh, you know <clears throat> here in this case the system was actually um, really old so they already had a certain um, certain systems to handle demographics to handle lab reports and all that we were not really um, committing all of that data directly so the way we did that was we had an app called legacy importer uh, <clears throat> again since we are using snowmet ct that also needs to be in a container right that also needs to be another app so snowmet ct again snowmet ct indian version we added all the indian drugs we added all the uh, specific drugs that this hospital needs so after that it's just response to http calls so the front end right what whatever you saw here this front end it makes api calls to this snowmed uh, india version and it gets that response back and that's how we did that now the hospital information system had all of these other things like labs demographics billing invoice and all that so whenever a lab report comes we tell them to make a HTTP call to this legacy importer application and then it imports that into open air using the KMC lab report v2 uh, archetype okay so again like patient practitioner everything is there in the old system uh, we get that using the legacy importer and then put it in the fire uh, service then this is kind of how it looks like the whole thing is based inside on an internal network um, so again there is also the emergency medicine EMR is what you saw they're also planning on making another app, which is the nurses app, and that will just sit right beside that emergency medicine uh, application. So the beauty here is that they are both talking to the same two services, and they are probably also going to be using these old services. So uh, the nurses can kind of use their own application to administer drugs and things like that, while the emergency medicine EMR, which is the proper doctor's app, can sit separately so you can build these apps separately uh yeah you can actually combine all of these apps together in one go so a hospital can also have a covid monitoring application and also have uh, an emr application and all of these can sit besides one another like accounting labs medication all of these di different services can just sit beside one another and this is what we call um the thin layer on top is the medblock stack we are making sure that these applications run wherever uh, you know you can deploy them and since we are using these standardized apis we are trying to make sure that uh, they will run no matter which implementation you use so you can replace this with you know these are all the name of the implementations 
you can have a solid implementation like happy fire ehr base which is the open source open air uh, server ori hydra for what to postgres the open source version for this or you can switch it out with the cloud provider the of your choice so you can use something like microsoft fire you can use better for the cdr you can use okta or auth0 for authentication and it will all still work it's just that this eventing system needs to be configured uh, and again this whole thing is not in production the whole app platform is not in production but it's we are working on that uh, we are trying to make it open source so that anyone can take and start building these applications and start putting it uh, putting in out what you have to offer the world uh, you can also put machine learning models as an app right if you can somehow package a machine learning model as a docker container um, that's all we need so you can respond to certain triggers and alert the doctor or send an sms to patients uh, you know it's up to you so that's it uh, what will you build and i think i'll take questions so uh, we are currently taking interns if you are interested you can uh, apply we are also you know seeking for talented candidates to join us at medblocks uh, just send me an email and i'll see and all of the people who had other questions also you can always send me an email so i will take questions yeah yes sir. so uh, when we made the composition from archetypes yeah. uh, like we made the uh, from a template sorry it it was a, it was in the format of opt right uh see the template is opt okay so the template yeah. opt is an xml file so we will get the xml file from the archetype designer then you put it to the uh, cdr you you throw it to the ehr base cdr after that whatever composition that you put is just going to be like the json that i showed you uh, so that is not the opt opt is the schema the composition looks different so we can use multiple formats what i was using is called the flat form the flat format but you can you have multiple formats for the composition as well okay uh, in the in the composition like uh, as you said the spo2 and on air you were having problems because uh, there's some there was some functionality between them right so you added this functionality with uh, javascript right yeah, 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 yeah. That's with JavaScript. Like only when on air is checked, this this will show. Yeah, that is JavaScript. Yeah. Okay, and um, my one last question is like uh, now we have a composition and we have uh, like made a form with uh, Metbox UI, right? So how do we implement that on uh, like in a web uh, website? Like how do you implement that while making your own app? Yeah, yeah. So Medblox UI is actually a set of web components. Okay, it works really well with Vue.js. It works well with uh, Angular. Uh, it doesn't work well with React. Okay, because React. Uh, so I'll show you this website. Uh, I think you've taken my contact, right? I'll just end this slide. Uh, I'll just put this in the yeah. side anyway. Uh, so yes, actually, we tried using Medblox UI with uh, React, and we were having some problem by uh, uh, sending data to the backend okay 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 so one thing is that react right so this is custom elements everywhere so uh, medblocks ui uses something called custom elements so all of these mb input mb thing uh, it basically converts normal things to uh, custom elements so custom elements is not handled by react well okay so it doesn't handle props and uh, attributes properly react has some problem so there is another thing called preact which is like react but then it has 100 percent compatibility with custom elements uh, so that you can use but if you have any issues posting to the back end also which back end are you using are you using ehr base uh, no i was using like uh, mongodb with my own model okay okay see if you're using your own model then you don't really need to use medblocks ui so medblocks ui we are trying to convert all of the normal input right like if you type a text or if there is a coded text we are trying to make it compliant with open air so that's where uh, the value is if you're just going to be using it with mongodb then i would say that just use normal uh, data elements like just use a normal input get that data put it in your mongodb uh, if that serves your functionality well you can just use mongodb and then map it out later on uh, but if you are using open air directly from day one then you need to 
first make the template first make the opt file and then put that opt file in the uh, ehr base uh, the cdr cdr will give you something called as a web template that web template you need to take and put in uh, actually you can export the web template also here directly so you can export web template here so once you get this web template uh, we also have a vs code extension called uh, medblocks ui vs code extension so this extension will help you with uh, which elements to put where so once you give it a web template right it will show you in the side uh, so i'll show you an example maybe so this is a project that I was working on okay just a second okay uh let that load it's the perfect time to download the server but anyway okay you can you you just use that uh, extension and it will show you what all you can put i uh, just check out my talk uh, i gave in the open air asia conference so that's where i demonstrate this how how the whole flow works making a front end so i make the front end using vue js there uh, but you can use any framework here except react so you can use any framework in custom elements everywhere that has like 100% compatibility so that includes svelte uh, i use svelte a lot so that's my recommendation so, okay. so uh, you are saying like uh, to get the most use of uh, medblocks ui i have to go with the uh, open ehr server right yeah 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 medblocks ui also supports fire but the point of medblocks ui itself is to make front ends uh, easier so that you know you can make the front end that talks directly to these services like open air and fire if you are not going to be bothered about the data right if you don't want the data to look a certain way if you don't want the data to only use a fire or a open air server then you can use anything then you can use anything that you want so yeah i think it loaded here so i'll just show you um, here right so in in this templates folder we have something called vitals.json so this is uh, what the open air uh, template web template will look like so once you get this web template uh, the medblocks ui extension will tell you what are all there okay so so i'll just show you an example quick demo so in index.html right i'm just going to paste uh, let's see so if i copy all of this uh, here there is a copy button and if i paste it it will paste all of these custom elements okay it will paste like mb context mb uh quantity all of this and this will this is actually the form that you saw in the low fidelity interface so it, this will automatically just render all of this form but then you can style it with css you can add conditional logic things like that so i would suggest you check out the uh, open air asia conference that talk there okay so and like uh, like i don't have much like knowledge about uh, open ehr server like how how to connect and uh, how to basically operate between the front end and the back end so what uh, source would you suggest me to check out to uh, like understand it like a very good so that i can implement it right 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 uh, i'm making a series right now there is not a lot of information out there i i'll be honest like there is not yeah, that yeah, much information yeah yeah that's what like my main concern was that yeah 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 the so work you're doing is amazing actually so yeah. i did not get any other right 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 source yeah. I'm I'm trying. I I am making uh, a series on open air. Uh, I already made till how to set up the server, how to post the compositions. I think if you follow till that point of the open air series, and then you look at the open air Asia conference, uh, you will try to connect. You'll you'll be able to connect the dots, and then you'll be able to like make a front end and the back end. So you can check that out. Uh, you know, open air is coming up really fast these days. Like a lot of countries are taking it up, and it's. I think that's where the future of India is also probably going. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, sir. Yes, Kanika. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, when you were showing us uh, certain applications like the COVID application, you have shown us some automatically generated forms. Yeah. So I want to ask you uh, whether the user who will be uh, the end user for these forms need to be familiar with their medical knowledge because the values that you have entered uh, are those values uh, which are uh, in the domain of medical sciences. So the user needs to be familiar. Uh, the forms, right? 
the forms the final end product of the forms is to give it to a person who is going to be at the point of care so if you are making if i'm making that covid application form right i would probably give it to the person who is actually taking care of the covid patients so yeah they will know that a temperature in degree fahrenheit cannot be more than 200 for example so uh, those things are there but uh, even without medical knowledge if they are there and they are like volunteers we usually add a lot of validation to make sure that they don't enter wrong data so yeah that you can ha- add some sort of validation but it's usually meant for the end user the end doctor slash nurse or person who is using it because sir uh, you have mentioned like there are uh, not many doctors or professionals available so if our volunteer is using uh, the platform so the person needs to be familiar with the value ranges yeah 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 i would say like one day orientation would be enough like just tell them what it means like what is spo2 what is like tem- temperature is fine i think everyone understands but if there are some technical terms again that's the whole process of uh, training someone on how to use the ehr right it's it's very similar like you can't um, start from day one and expect everyone to understand what it means and if they are volunteers maybe you can change the name you can change it maybe you can put some description here and there and then add some uh, steps like a tutorial to walk them through so that's always possible yes it's and this okay in case you are not there so dr namesh it gives immense pleasure uh, to listen to your lecture and to have such an interactive se- session with so many questions from the participants during the middle of the session thank you so much dr p sure thanks a lot all right uh, okay thank you bye yeah so, so all, all the best everyone uh, again thank you for inviting me i'm quite honored uh, so yeah thank you Okay thanks thanks to thanks to all the participants also and uh, we we'll have tomorrow our session at 9:30 so please fill your attendance and feedback also dr ramesh will be sharing the participants feedback also with you thank you so okay. much all right bye okay Thank you for watching this video. Please hit that like button, please hit the subscribe button and if you have any questions leave them down in the comments below. You can also write to me at siddarth@medblocks.org and I'll get back to you. See you in the next one.